trousers down. My best friend Mart said that we could take rucksacks and drinks and sandwiches and raisins and chocolate and go and climb the sugar loaf. I said that it was miles and we might get lost, but he said he knew how to read maps. And we had walked 15 miles in a day before when we went with our parents. So we did. We climbed the sugar loaf all on our own with our rucksacks. Sugarloaf's a mountain with one bit in Wales and one bit in England. We were so pleased when we got to the top, we said we ought to celebrate. We discussed this as we sat at the top eating our sandwiches and raisins and chocolate. I know, said Mart, I've got it. You see that path down there? That's the way we go to get home. Somewhere along the path is the border between Wales and England. We leave Wales and we go into England. What we do, he said, is we celebrate by walking into England with our trousers down. But how will we know where the border is, I said. Well, he said, I don't know exactly where it is, but by looking at the map, I've got a pretty good idea. So when I say we're getting near to the border, we take our trousers down. Then for the next few minutes, we walk along with our trousers down until I reckon from the map that we're in England. What do you think? I said, I thought it was a brilliant plan. So we packed up our stuff and headed down the mountain. Mart was studying the map. And then he suddenly said, we're getting there, trousers down. So we took our trousers down and our underpants and we started walking on down the path. It wasn't very easy because you can't take very big strides with trousers and pants round your ankles. But we kept on. I said, what if we see someone, Mart? We'll have to pull our trousers up and wait till they're gone, he says. Then we take our trousers down again and carry on. <laughs> we can't give up just because some people turn up. Ah, oh, that's true, I said. So we walked on and Mart started singing. We're walking into England with our trousers down, with our trousers down, with our trousers down. We're walking into England with our trousers down. Oh yeah! Nobody did turn up and after quite some time I said, uh, are we in England yet, Mart? And he studied the map and said, yeah. We must be by now. So we pulled our pants and trousers up and headed back to the campsite. When we got back, our mums and dads asked us how we got on. Did you climb? Right to the top of the sugar loaf? Oh yeah, said Mark. Yeah, no problem. But you must have walked something like 15 miles, my dad said. That's it, said Mark. Yep. Well done, boys said Mart's dad, and I was feeling really proud, so I said, and we walked into England with our trousers down. There was silence. You what? said my dad. We walked into England with our trousers down. Why in heaven's name did you do that, he said. To celebrate. We had climbed the sugar loaf. Do you understand that, Connie? my dad said to my mum. Do you? He turned to Mart's parents. What have we done? Hmm? We've brought up two completely crazy children. They go out, they climb a mountain, they walk 15 miles, they read maps, they carry their own food and drink, they show themselves to be really capable, responsible boys, and then what do they do? They walk all over the countryside with their trousers down. How come we've produced two complete idiots? Where do we go wrong? I thought, wrong, wrong. You haven't gone wrong. Me and Mark did something really brilliant today. I mean, I bet there's not many people in the world who can say that they've walked into England with their trousers down. Arrows. Me and my friend Harry Bow, we were playing arrows. You take the grass that's got pointed tops, you pull one off and you pew, throw it. It can glide through the air. And if it lands on something soft, it can stick in. 
in something like a jumper or your hair. We love playing arrows. We found this open window on the wall of the alley by my house. We stood back from the window to see who could get an arrow through the window. First it was his turn, then mine. Pew! 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 Mostly they missed. Then, pew! One went in! Yeah! Arrow! We shouted. Then we carried on. Pew! Pew! Missing again and again. <laughs> All of a sudden, a man appeared in the alley. It was the man we called Baldy. He came marching up and stood there in front of us. He holds out his hand. He looked down at it. What do you think this is, eh? He shouted. We looked down. There, stuck between his fingers, was an arrow. He told us to clear off, and we did. Later, when we sat down round at Haribo's place, we talked about how the arrow must have gone whizzing through the window and landed on his hand. And we imagined him sitting there and an arrow coming from nowhere, and just happening to land on his hand. Wow! What a shot! And we laughed and laughed. Then, much later, Haribo said, I wonder whose arrow it was. Yours or mine? And neither of us knew. And neither of us will ever know. Gymnastics. When my mum and dad went out, we moved the chair to the end of the settee. And then we used to take it in turns to do dive bombs off the chair onto the settee. Stand by. Whee! Kerflump. Great. Jump down onto the floor, back onto the chair. Stand by for the dive bomb. Whee! Kerflump. Wow. Did you see that one? Then we put another chair on the other end of the settee and rammed the table up close to that chair. Then you could dive bomb off the chair onto the settee. Whee! Kerflump. Climb onto the chair at the other end of the city, then up onto the table, leap off the table like a red devil, yahoo! Bam! Onto the floor. Then we piled up all the cushions in the corner so you could go tunneling along the wall, round the corner, back to the chair, next to the city, jugga, 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 and banging your feet on the floorboards, thudder, 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 thudder. Great! I asked Harry Bo, Tony Sanders, Lizzie Gray and Hendy over, and all seven of us went round. Great! Next day, we all met up and it was Lizzie who said, Hey, after we've dive-bombed the city, we could trampoline for a bit. Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. And then if we pulled the flaps out of the table, we could do marching on the table. Clomp, 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 clomp. Great, I said. Come over. Yeah, we'll come over for gymnastics at Rosie's place. So that night, we dashed out of school, into our front room, moved the furniture around, and away we went. Stand by for dive bomb. Whee! Kerflump! Onto the city, trampoline. Bouncy, 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 bouncy. Up onto chair number two. Up onto the table. March. Clomp, 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 clomp. Red devil! Yahoo! Bam! Onto the floor. Jugger, 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 jugger. Under the cushions. Thudder, 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 thudder. And back to chair number one. All seven of us. Great! Screaming our heads off. Round and round our gymnastics course. Then the doorbell rang. Right in the middle of our session. The doorbell. I went and answered the door. It was the man from downstairs. He looked at me for a long time. And then he started to speak. Is your father in? No, I said. Tell him I want a word with him when he comes in, will you? He said. Yeah, I said. He went on looking at me. I could hear him breathing and his eyes were getting big and his mouth was tightening up. And then he shouted, my light fitting has just fallen out of my ceiling. What's going on? 
I've never heard anything like it. What have you got in there? Hmm? A herd of elephants? My light fitting has just fallen out of my ceiling. There, all quiet, he said. I shall tell your mother and father about this. Don't you worry, Sonny. You'll see. He went indoors. I dashed back to the front room. They were lying about all over the floor, panting and giggling. Yeah! That, that was the man from downstairs. He says we've bust his light or something. Blimey, one of them says. You're in trouble. Yeah. Rose is in trouble, they said, and they got up off the floor and dashed out the house. You can bet they didn't hang about or anything. The go-kart. Me and my mate Haribo, we once made a go-kart. Everyone was making go-karts, so we had to make one. Big Tony's was terrific. Big Tony was terrific, because Big Tony told us he was. What he said was, I am terrific. And because Big Tony was very big, no one said, uh, Big Tony, you're not terrific. So, Big Tony was terrific, and Big Tony's go-kart was terrific, and that was that. When Big Tony sat on his go-kart, he looked like a real driver. He had control. When he came down a road round our way called Moss Lane, he could make the wind blow in his hair. He could make the wheels of his go-kart go, and he went, as he went past. I was jealous of Big Tony. I was afraid that I thought he might be terrific. So me and Haribo, we made a go-kart out of his old pram and some boxes and crates we got from the off-license. We nailed it up with bent nails, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should use big metal staples. And he gave us some. He said they were Heavy duty. Heavy duty? Wow, that sounded terrific. So then we tied cord round the front cross piece, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should use the pram handle. And he helped us fix the pram handle to the cross piece. He said, that'll give you control. Control. Wow, that sounded Terrific. Haribo sat on the beer crate and steered. I kneeled behind, but Haribo's dad said, no, 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 no. You should kneel on foam pads. And he cut these two foam pads for me to kneel on. Haribo's dad said, that will help you last the course. Last the course. Wow. That sounded terrific. Our go-kart was ready. So we took it up to the top of Moss Lane and Haribo said, I'll steer. And he did. It was fantastic. It felt just like Big Tony looked. The hair in the wind. The wheels. So we both went. So we took it up the top of Moss Lane again and Haribo said, I'll steer. And he did. It was amazing. The road went blurry, the hair in the wind. The wheels went. So we both went. So we took it up the top of Moss Lane again and Harry Bow said, I'll steer. So I said, can I have a go? Harry Bow said, no. Oh, go on, I said. No, he said, you've never done it before. Oh, go on, Harry Bo, let me have a go. Go on, I mean. Blimey, come on, Harry Bo. Go on. No. Oh, go on, oh, go on, I mean, go, go on. All right, he said. Now look out, won't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know, I said. I thought, I am going to be terrific. My hair. Whew. My wheels, me, and away we went. Hair, yeah, the wheels, yeah, me, yeah, but halfway down Moss Lane, there's Moss Close, and that's where the road curves, and that's where Big Tony steers, Big Tony leans, Big Tony controls. 
Yeah, I saw. Moss close. Coming up really fast. Steer! shouts Haribo. Steer! You big wally! And I yanked the pram handle. Ugh. And the whole world went round one and twice, and three times, and my head went rolling down the road, pulling me after it, and then the go-kart came for the ride, over and over and over, until my nose and my chin and my two front teeth landed up in the grit of the gutter. Haribo was crying. I breathed in, and it kind of whistled. There it was again. I stuck my finger up to my tooth, and it was chipped. Haribo said, your chin's bleeding. And I said, yeah, your chin's bleeding. And oh, no, he said. We walked home. He pulled the cart, got to his place. He didn't say anything, nothing at all, not a word. And he went in. I walked onto my place. It was still whistling. When I got in, I told mum everything, and she said, well, she said all kinds of things like, well, your teeth will probably fall out, you know. One of those nice things that mum sometimes say. Next day at school, they were all asking about the crash. They all looked at my tooth. And then they wanted to see the go-kart. Haribo said, you can't. Because my dad's chopped it up. Chopped up? Wow. That sounded terrible. Hey. When Haribo got his racer, his brand new racing bike for Christmas, I, I didn't ask him for a go on it. No, I didn't, no. <laughs> no, I didn't. I wonder why. Mart was my best friend. Mart was my best friend. I thought he was great. But one day, he tried to do for me. I had a hat, a woolly one. And I loved that hat. It was warm and tight. My mum had knitted it and I wore it everywhere. One day, me and Mart, we were out and we were standing at a bus stop. And suddenly he goes and grabs my hat and chucked it over the wall. He thought I was going to go in there and get it out. He thought he'd make me do that because he knew I liked that hat so much I wouldn't be able to stand being without it. He was right. I could hardly bear it. I was really scared I'd never get it back, but I never let on. I never showed it on my face. I just waited. Aren't you going to get your hat? He says. Your hat's gone, he says. Your hat's over the wall. I looked the other way. But I could still feel on my head how he had pulled it off. Your hat's over the wall, he says didn't say a thing. Then the bus came round the corner at the end of the road. If I go home without my hat, I'm going to walk through the door and Mum's going to say, where's your hat? And if I say, it's over a wall, she's going to say, well, what's it doing there? And I'm going to say, Mark chucked it over. And she's going to say, well, why didn't you go for it? And what am I going to say then? What am I going to say then? The bus was coming up. Aren't you going over for your hat? There won't be another bus for ages, Mart says. The bus stopped. I got on. Mark got on. The bus moved off. You've lost your hat, Mart says. You've lost your hat, Mart says. Two stops ahead was our stop. Are you going indoors without it, Mart says. I didn't say a thing. The bus stopped. Mart got up and dashed downstairs. He had got off one stop early. I got off when we got to our stop. I went home, walked through the door. Where's your hat, Mum says. Over a wall, I said. Oh, what's it doing there, she says. Mart chucked it over there, I said. But you haven't left it there, have you, she says. Yeah, I said. Well, don't you ever come asking me to make you anything like that again. You make me tired, you do, she says. Later, I was drinking some orange juice. The front doorbell rang. It was Mart. He had the hat in his hand. He handed it to me and went. I shut the front door, put on the hat, walked into the kitchen. 
Mum looked up. You don't need to wear your hat indoors, do you, she said. I will for a bit, I said. And I did. Keith's cupboard. Have you ever looked in Keith's cupboard? You ought to. You've never seen anything like Keith's cupboard. Let's go over to Keith's place and look in Keith's cupboard. So, when you get to Keith's place, you say, Can we play with your garage? And he says, No. So we say, Can we play in your tent? And he says, No. So you say, Can we play with your crane? And he says, No. So you go up to Keith's mum and you say, Can we play in Keith's tent? And she says, Keith! Keith! Why don't you get the tent out? OK says Keith, and he starts going over to the cupboard. Keith's cupboard. He opens it and, phew, you've never seen anything like Keith's cupboard in it. There's trucks and garages and tents and cranes and forts and bikes and puppets and games and models and superhero suits and hats and he never plays with any of it. They keep buying him all this stuff and he never plays with it. Day after day after day, it all sits in Keith's cupboard. You ought to go over to his place sometime and have a look. Keith's cupboard. Phew. It would be great if you subscribed, that is, become a subscriber. That way you get to see when I post up new vids. Yo-yo. Mart's mum was looking after me. But Mart wasn't there. Mart's mum said, I could play with Mart's yo-yo. Mart's mum said, it was Mart's best yo-yo. Mart's mum said, you can go outside and play with Mart's best yo-yo outside. I went outside with Mart's best yo-yo. I tried to do around the world. I tried to do walk the dog. Then I did my own thing with Mart's best yo-yo. I whirled it round and round above my head. I'm a helicopter, I said. I whirled Mart's best yo-yo round and round above my head. Round and round and round. Then I let go. I didn't mean to let go of Mart's best yo-yo. Actually, I don't think it was me who let go of Mart's best yo-yo. I think Mart's best yo-yo let go of me. Mart's best yo-yo went flying through the air, over a fence, and then over another fence. I don't know where Mart's best yo-yo went. It just went. I went indoors. Mart's mum was looking at me. I pretended I had Mart's best yo-yo in my hand and I stretched out my arm and pretended to put Mart's best yo-yo next to the biscuit jar. Mart's mum watched. Mart's mum went over to the biscuit jar. Where's the yo-yo, she said. It's gone, I said. Gone, she said. It just went, I said. It just went. It just went. Where, she said. I don't know, I said. That was Mart's best yo-yo, Mart's mum said. I know, I said. This poem comes from... Jelly Boots, Smelly Boots with Wonderful Pictures by David Taziman, published by Bloomsbury. The Raft. Mart and me made a raft for the river. Thick branches crisscrossed and tied with rope. Empty cans on top to help it float. Mart and me would row about on the water. We'd cross to the other side. We'd row downstream. Upstream, under the trees, 
between the fields. We'd be river rovers. The river would be ours. We made the raft at the water's edge. We pushed it out into the shallows. Mart got on. Are you getting on, he said. Uh, not yet, I said. And then whew, it flipped. It flipped right over. Mart was under the raft. The raft was on top of him. He was underwater. I couldn't lift it off him. The crisscross branches were like a cage holding him down in the river water. His face came up into a space between the branches. He called out. Argh! He went under again into the river. I tried to lift the raft, but he was clinging onto it underneath. I couldn't lift the raft. His face came up into the space again. I could see his hands gripping the branches. He was trying to get air, <gasps> but he couldn't get his mouth up high enough into the space. So his mouth was filling up with river water. Then he went under again and the space where his face had been was river brown. Mart's brother Tony stepped into the shallows, grabbed the raft and hoisted it up with Mart still clinging to it. Mart choked, <laughs> coughed and spat. He sat on the riverbank, shuddering. His clothes stuck to him like another skin. Mart's mum and dad and my mum and dad had a conference. They decided that there would be no rafting. Plastic. My friend's dad says that plastic is fantastic. He says you can make anything out of plastic. When I go round to his house, we eat our dinner off plastic plates. We chop up our food with plastic knives and we eat with plastic forks and plastic spoons and we drink our drinks out of plastic cups. He said that one day in the future, everything would be made out of plastic. My friend's mum said it was time to eat now. It was egg on toast. I picked up my plastic knife and plastic fork and cut into my egg, but the plastic fork wouldn't stick into the egg and the plastic knife wouldn't cut the egg. For a moment, I thought it was because my plastic knife and plastic fork weren't good enough to cut my egg. Then I noticed that my friend's mum and dad were looking at me and smiling. I looked a bit more closely at the egg. It was a plastic egg. My friend's mum and dad said that it was a joke. It was a joke egg. I said to my friend's dad, maybe one day in the future, eggs would be made out of plastic too. That was a plastic joke. Haribo. Once my friend Haribo came to school crying. We said, what's the matter? What's the matter? And he said his granddad had died. So he didn't know what to say. Then I said, how did he die? And he said, he was standing on St Pancras station waiting for the train and he just fell over and died. And then he started crying again. He was a nice man, Haribo's granddad. He had a shed with tins full of screws in it. Mind you, my gran was nice too. She gave me and my brother a red shoehorn each. Maybe Haribo's granddad gave Haribo a red shoehorn. Dave said, my hamster died as well. So everyone said, shh. And Dave said, I was only saying. And I said, my gran gave me a red shoehorn. Rog said, I got a pair of trainers for Christmas. And Haribo said, you can get ones without laces. And we all said, yeah, no, that's right, Haribo, you can. Any other day we'd have said, of course you can. We know that, you fool. But that day we said, yeah, that's right, Haribo. Yeah, no, no, you can, yeah. Cool guy and fool guy.
cool guy met fool guy going down the street. Said cool guy to fool guy, who you gonna meet? Said fool guy to cool guy, I don't want no meat. Said cool guy to fool guy, I mean meat, not meat. Darren's car. Now children, today we're going to use our imaginations. And I want you to think, if you could turn into an animal, what animal would you choose to be? Yes, Donna, a cat. That's nice. And why would you like to be a cat? Because you like to be all cuddly and sit by the radiator in winter and stay warm. Lovely. Darren? No, Darren, a car isn't an animal. I'll come back to you in a minute. Zoe, a cat. Yes, that's nice, but let's think of some other animals, shall we? Uh, yes, Zoe, I understand you want to be a cat too, but Donna's the cat. Yes, I know there could be two cats here, but Donna used up all that magic that makes cats. You're going to be something else. A leopard? Hmm? A panther? No? OK, Zoe, you're a cat. Just remember, you had your chance to be something else. Never mind. Darren, I've told you, you can't be a car. No, not even your dad's car. It's just not going to happen for you today. OK? Oh, Zoe, <laughs> now you do want to be something else. What do you want to be? A jellyfish. <laughs> Very interesting. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Mervyn, how about you? A slug. Mervyn, is this all getting um, silly? No? You want to be a slug so you can lie about in your backyard so that your cousin will tread on you and go, ugh. Hmm, nice, Mervyn. Very nice. Darren, no. I mean, no, not your uncle's car. I don't care that your uncle's got a BMW. You're not going to be a BMW today. And Louise, what would you like to be? An eagle? A dolphin? Anyone thought of being a dolphin? Leaping through the, what? A cockroach. Louise, why in heaven's name do you want to be a cockroach? Oh, I see. Because you've got cockroaches at home and your mother says there's nothing you can do to get rid of them. Yes, Louise. Yes, I, I get the point. But cockroaches are, um, well, um, OK, be a cockroach. But Darren, you cannot be a car. You can't be your dad's car. You can't be your uncle's car or any car whatsoever. Hmm? Well, yes, I understand. OK, you can be a car with your dog in it. Very clever. Yes, yes, your uncle's BMW, if you like. No, you won't be doing a ton on the motorway, Darren. You've got a dog on board. Remember? Well, that starts us off. We'll do some more of that tomorrow. Perhaps. I'm not going places with them again. When we went to Chessington Zoo with the club, we all went in and the leader said, Right, listen everyone, listen everyone, everyone listen. You can all go off where you like for the next two hours and we'll all meet up here at four o'clock, at four o'clock, OK? Then we all went off where we liked. I saw the lions and the seals and the parrots and the giraffes and the crocodiles. <laughs> I ate my cheese and pickle sandwiches, a packet of crisps and drank some of my fizzy orange and ate a chocolate Swiss roll. Then I asked someone the time and she said, four o'clock. So I went back to where we had to meet. When I got there, everyone started shouting at me. Where have you been? Hmm? Where do you think you've been? We've been looking for you for hours. We couldn't find you anywhere. We've scarcely had a chance to see any of the animals. Where have you been? I looked at them and I said, well, I've been walking around the zoo. I'm on time, aren't I? So then they started shouting at me again. You weren't supposed to wander off on your own, were you? You were supposed to be in your group. Everyone else was in their groups. You weren't, were you? No. Well, we've got to go now. Just think, you've spoilt everyone's afternoon now. I listened to all that, but I wasn't sorry. They said, you can all go off now. 
They didn't say anything about groups. What groups? I'm not going places with them again. One day when I was young, one day when I was young, there was going to be a fancy dress show. For a while, I couldn't think who to go as. I didn't have any cowboy hats or moustaches or angel's wings. I couldn't think what to go as. Then I suddenly thought I could go as my mum. I could get up in an old skirt of hers, hat and coat, and there I'd be, my mum. Mum thought it was a really good idea, and she gave me her old green skirt she didn't wear anymore, and a horrible fawn coat jacket thing with big shoulders and gold buttons. I wore shorts under the skirt, no socks, just sandals. I put on a straw hat, and Mum found me an old black shiny handbag, dressed up like that. I now had to get to the hall where the show was on. I waited till it was dark and then ran through the streets, holding the skirt up round my knees. When I got there, it had already begun. And I couldn't quite understand what was going on because you see, all the rest of the children were standing around in the hall, very, very still. And the woman in charge was going round, putting her face very close to the children's faces and trying to make them laugh. So there was Richard Russell, who had a beard, a black shirt, a pair of his sister's tights on, and one of those white frilly things you put round birthday cakes he had round his neck. And the woman was right up against his nose and saying in a very high voice, Hello, Willie, Willie, Willie Shakespeare. Have you written a play today, Willie? Someone said I had to go and stand out there and I wasn't to laugh and I'd win. So I went out there and she went on round the hall talking in this very high voice. Hello, big ears. Where's Noddy? Beep, beep in his little car, is he? And they were creasing up in giggles all over the place. Then she got to me and she said, who are you? My mum. I said, and everyone in the hall laughed. They laughed and laughed and laughed. At first, I thought they were laughing because I'd made a good joke. And then I saw that they were laughing because they thought I was stupid. That annoyed me. So this woman, who had also laughed at me, now tried to make me laugh by putting her big puffy red face close to mine and saying, are you my mum? Oh, you are looking nice today, mummy. Well, obviously I didn't think that was very funny. In fact, I thought it was pathetic, but she kept at it. Hello, Mummy. Mummy, can I have some sweeties, please? So I didn't laugh, but the others did. But I didn't win, though. I think um, Big Ears won. He got a box of chocolates and a pack of cards. Then we all went home. As we were walking down the road, away from the place, a boy called Terence, who wasn't allowed to play with me because his mum said I was common, he said, you're daft, you are. Why did you come dressed up as your mother? You wouldn't find your mother in Madame Tussaud's waxworks, would you? When I got in, I asked Mum what a waxworks was. She told me it was a place where they make big, life-size dolls of famous people. Then I said, I didn't win, Mum, because you're not famous enough to be a waxwork. Oh, well, never mind, she says. We can't all be famous, can we, she says. But I said, but no, don't you see? I didn't laugh. I should have won. I didn't laugh. The bell. There are 48 children in my class. We sit in four rows of 12. We sit in twos, one next to the other, at desks with two lids, side by side, one each. Miss Williams works out where we sit. We do tests, arithmetic and English. She adds up the marks, and whoever's got the best mark sits at the top of the class, in the desk at the end of the first row next to the window. Whoever gets the worst mark sits at the bottom of the fourth row, furthest from the window. 
And she works out everyone else's place from the mark that they get. She does this every week. Every week we do the tests. Every week we change places. We take everything out of our desks and move very quietly to where she tells us to go. This way we always know who's better than you and we always know who's worse than you. Unless you come top when there's no one better than you. Unless you come bottom when there's no one worse than you. The same people are always in the top row. The same people are always in the bottom row. The same people are always in the two rows in between. Miss Williams says that only the top two will pass their 11 plus. She stands next to the last person on the end of the second row. She holds up her hands as if she's helping people cross the road. This side will pass, she says. This side will fail, she says. This way we know who are the 11 plus failures and who are the 11 plus passes. And we all know that before we've even taken the 11 plus exam. Next door, there's another class. They are all 11 plus failures. I want to be 12th. This is because the person who is 12th sits nearest to the bell that sits on top of Miss Williams's cupboard when you're 12th. You take the bell, you go out of the room, you go downstairs and you stand in the hallway outside the head teacher's office and shake the bell so loudly that the gonging fills the classrooms and all the spaces in between. All the children and teachers hear the sound and come out of their classes and walk very quietly down the stairs and out into the playground, all because you rang the bell. I never have come 12th. The Hypnotizer. Once a boy called Richard came to school and said, I can hypnotize people. So he said, yeah, yeah, I bet you can't. So he said, okay, playtime. So playtime, we all went on to the playground. He said, right, who wants to go? So Trevor said, yeah, me. So this boy, Richard, bade Trevor lie down on the ground on his back and he took this gold ring out of his pocket and he put it very carefully between Trevor's eyes on the bridge of his nose. Then Richard took this conker out of his pocket. It was on the end of a string and he starts swinging the conker to and fro in front of Trevor's eyes and he starts up talking in this spooky voice. Watch the conker, watch the conker, go to sleep, go to sleep. Watch the conker, watch the conker, go to sleep, go to sleep. And it went on for ages. And we were all crowding round, dead quiet, watching Trevor, listening to Richard going, go to sleep, go to sleep. Is it working, we said. Is he going to sleep? He's hypnotised. Blimey. Suddenly, the going in bell went, boing, boing. At that, Trevor goes and stands up. He just stands up, ha, dusts himself down. So we all crowded round him going, were you asleep? You, you were asleep, weren't you, Trevor? Hey, were you hypnotised? And he looks at us, all fed up, and he says, only thing that happened was I got a rotten headache. After that, we used to go around telling people, you see that bloke over there? Him, Richard, he's brilliant. He can hypnotise people. He's a hypnotizer, you know. And Richard, he'd hear us saying all this, and he'd go, <laughs> yeah, I'll come off at you lot. I'm, I'm, not that, no, I'm not that good at it. <laughs> the watch. My mum and dad gave me a watch. Not a posh watch. Good enough to tell the time by though. And it went well enough until one day at a camp we were playing. Smugglers and customs over the sand dunes. I was a smuggler and I had to get £20,000 through the customs for us to win the game. £20,000 written on a piece of paper. There were three ways to get past the customs. One, by running so fast the customs couldn't catch you. Two, by going creepy crawly, so they couldn't see you. And three, going through the customs with it hidden somewhere. I chose 
three. I chose to hide it on me somewhere. But where? I know, I said. I'll stuff it in my watch. And I took the bag off my watch, folded up the piece of paper with the £20,000 written on it, slipped it into the watch and clipped the back of my watch on. So then I went creepy crawly over the sand dunes. They saw me, they grabbed me and they searched me. They looked in my pockets. They looked in my shoes. They looked in my socks. They looked in my jumper. Down my jumper, down my shirt, in my armpits. They even looked under my watch. But they never thought to look in my watch, did they? So they let me go. And when I got to the other end, where the other smugglers were, I said, Hooray! I got through! And I opened up the back of my watch, and there it was. £20,000. I took it out, handed it over, and we had won the game. I snapped the back of my watch on, looked at the time, and my watch. It stopped. It was broken. I'd broken it. That evening, I told my brother all about it, and I said, Don't tell Mum or Dad about it, or I'll get into trouble. I'll get it mended secretly. So there we were, tea time, and my brother suddenly goes, What's the time, Mick? And I, I, I went all red and, and, and kind of flustered. And I go, um, um, yeah, uh, and I look at my watch and I go, um, yeah, it's, um, it's about six o'clock. No, it's not, says my dad. It's seven o'clock. And he sees me going red. Is your watch going wrong? Uh, no, no, it's OK. Let's have a look. No, no, it's, it's all right. It's, uh, it's all right. Let's have a look. Let me have a look at it. It stopped. It's broken. How did it get broken? I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? My brother was still laughing all over his face without making a sound. So then I told my dad all about the smugglers and customs and hiding the money in my wallet. He was furious. We gave you the watch so you could tell the time. Not for you to use as part of a secret agent smuggling outfit. Well, don't expect us to buy you presents like that again. I was so angry with my brother for getting me into trouble. Inside, I was bubbling. So as soon as tea was over, I went down to our backyard where there was an old cherry tree and I broke a twig off it and it was all prickly and flaky and covered in a kind of grey slimy muck. So then I took this twig back upstairs into our bedroom and I'll tell you what I did with it. I shoved it into his bed and as I shoved it into his bed I thought this will pay him back, this will pay back. This will pay him back. He's going to get into bed tonight after I'm asleep and his feet are going to get all prickled up and covered in grey, mucky, slimy stuff. Well, later that evening, I was doing some homework and I had some really hard sums to do. I couldn't do them. I was stuck. And my brother, he sees me scribbling out all these numbers. And the page is a mess. So my brother, he says, What's up? Do you want a bit of help with your sums? What could I say to that? First I go, no, no, no. It's all right. But he goes, no, come on. I'll lend you a hand. So I say, OK. And he comes over and he helps me. He's sitting there right next to me. My enemy showing me how to do my sums. And then he said, now you try. 
and then I could do them. So there I was, friends with him, grateful. I'm saying, thanks. Thanks for helping me. But in the back of my mind, I know something. The twig was still in the bed. I didn't know what to say. All I could see was the twig sitting in his bed, just where his feet would get it. Even if I went and got it out, there'd still be a heap of dirty prickly bits left in his bed after he showed me how to get all the sums right. So I go, look, um, when you go to bed tonight, there'll be a twig in your bed. So he goes, a twig in my bed? A twig in my bed? How did it get there then? So I say, I put it there. And my mum and dad heard that. So my dad goes, you put a twig in his bed. Did I hear that right? You put a twig in his bed? Might I ask, why did you put a twig in his bed? And I just couldn't say. I just sat there like a lemon. I couldn't say it was to pay him back for telling on me about the watch because they wouldn't think there was anything wrong with him doing that. So I just sat there and then I said, I don't know. What a stupid thing to say. And my dad goes, you don't know why you put a twig in his bed? You don't know why? The boy's going mad. First thing he does is smash up his watch. And the next thing, he's going round stuffing twigs in people's beds. He's going stark staring mad, I tell you. I didn't think I was going mad. And I don't think my brother did. I bet he knew why I put a twig in his bed. After dark. Outside, after dark, trains hum and traffic lights wink. After dark, after dark. In here, after dark, curtains shake, cupboards creak. After dark, after dark. Under the covers, after dark, I twiddle my toes and hug my pillow. After dark. After dark. Science. We were doing science. Properties of matter. Solid, liquid, gas, ice, water, water vapour. Everything in the universe is solid, liquid or gas. Take something solid, warm it up enough and it'll become liquid. Warm it up more and it'll become gas. Cool the gas down enough and it'll become a liquid. Cool it even more and it'll become a solid. Haribo whispered to me, Hey, you could freeze a fart. Yeah, I said, and you'd have a little farty ice cube. Yeah, he said, solid fart. We were doing science. Properties of matter. It would be great if you subscribed, that is, become a subscriber. That way you get to see when I post up new vids.